Um, and what you can do, Dr. Golden, is, is you can also uh, go to YouTube. I'll send you the, the link um, and you can actually see the video uh, as it's playing there live and you can see the comments coming in. Um, okay. So I'll, I'll send that to your, uh, I guess. If you, if you send it to my, if you send it to my messenger, I can access it right here on my laptop. Okay, no problem. I'll do that right now. Uh, so I'm going to wait for a few more people to come in since we're live. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people will, you know, I've sent out a, a, a notification yesterday that the show will be happening. So people yes. will start filling in and you can actually see right now we got a, we got about 12 people watching okay. uh, and it'll continue to build. And then I'll, you know, I'll okay. introduce you. Uh, let me shoot this message to you real quick. Mm -hmm. Just remember to, to turn the volume off on it uh, when you, when you open it up. On the YouTube video. On the YouTube video, yeah. Uh, but you can at least keep up with the comments. Um, sure. And we'll have some questions uh, from the comment section toward directed at you. Um, okay. but let me see. So, okay. All right. So looks like we're good. We're getting some people in here. Alpha Sigma, uh, what's up? Excalibur, Ibmore76, uh, BGL. What's going on? Um, definitely, as you guys come in, please hit the like button. Um, also, hit the, uh, uh, the uh, what you call it, the uh, subscribe uh, link if you haven't done that before. And hit the bell so you'll be notified when we start new shows. Man Friday, what's up? Uh, so we have a few people coming in. Let me just take care of one other thing as we have some people coming in. So those that don't know, I just finished a, a show on Inner Light Radio. I'll be posting that no later than tomorrow when my editor uh, can get me a finished copy. And I'm going into my second show of the day. Uh, and I've really been looking forward to this. Um, hold on. Where, where did the thing go? One moment, please. I'm just trying to get this set up been having technical difficulties uh all day today so please uh support the channel uh if you will uh so we can keep up this kind of programming um getting some good people in here uh what's up cats uh, anwar how you doing brother uh maleka what's going on all right. Now we are we are joined today by somebody that I, I want to start with an apology because I asked the brother if he'd be willing to come on to my show um, back in the fall, the end of the fall. And he was kind enough to say yes. And then I got swamped with end of the semester kind of responsibilities, which I know he knows all about. Um, yes. And and when I came back to him the other week, he was gracious enough to say, yeah, he'd come back. And he had every reason in the world to be like, man, <laughs> I'm not coming back in there. You left me hanging. So I apologize for that. And I wanted to do that on the air. But we are joined by the esteemed uh, Dr. Tim Golden. Um, uh, and, and I want to just give you a little information about him as we get started, because uh, this is an incredible brother, uh, Dr. Timothy Golden who is currently professor of philosophy at Walla Walla University, um, has his PhD uh, from University of Memphis in philosophy. Dissertation was ontotheology, subjectivity, and the alchemy of transcendence. Uh, masters at Westchester University of Pennsylvania in philosophy. JD at Thurgood Marshall School of Law, Texas Southern University, and his bachelor's at Westchester University of Pennsylvania. Areas of specialization, 19th and 20th century continental philosophy, philosophy of religion, philosophical theology, African-American philosophy, critical race theory. Um, he also teaches moral philosophy, philosophy of law, modern philosophy, ancient philosophy, social and political philosophy, <laughs> and has authored um, uh, a number of texts. Um, he authored uh, his, I believe this might be, uh, your your dissertation, Subjectivity, Transcendence, and the Problem of Ontotheology, as well as Fred, uh, Frederick Douglass and the Philosophy of Religion, uh, has an edited text um, that's forthcoming, Racism and Resistance, Essays on Derek Bell's Racial Realism, 
and a number of book chapters uh, and peer review works. Uh, very powerful brother um, uh, who I just I want to welcome to the Onyx Report. Um, so thank you for coming in, man. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Johnson. I'm, I'm humbled that you would extend the invitation to me and um, I'm blessed and excited to be with you tonight. So thank you. Oh man, no, thank you. And we're gonna be putting the link to your TED talk in the chat. Um, so I definitely want people to check that out uh, because as we'll get into tonight, um, some very, you know, deep, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm even having trouble framing it. I mean, uh, as you're listening to it, he's clearly, you know, covering it as a scholar, but then he goes to places that, that many scholars are not, are not able or willing to go. And there's a great deal of, of transparency, some deep um, uh, opening up of, 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 of past traumas, pain. And he puts that into a framework to help us understand how we as black men can advance. So, I mean, if you haven't had a chance to check um, his TED Talk again, we're going to put the link um, in, in the chat. Definitely check it out. Very powerful presentation that is moving, uh, especially if you've experienced any kind of trauma that you haven't been able to put words to. Uh, so, I think throughout the course of the, discuss the discussion tonight, we'll get to we'll get to some of that. What I generally like to start with when I interview people is I want to get a sense of, of who we're talking to, where they're from, and how they came to where they are in their life. So Dr. Golden, um, tell us a little bit about your upbringing, where you're from, and, and what was the, the, the environment like that you came out of? Sure. Thank you very much uh, again, Dr. Johnson. Well, I'm, I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania originally. I was okay. born and raised there. I was born uh, to an African-American father and a Caucasian mother. Okay. Um, so I was raised, however, in an African-American neighborhood. And the reason for that, and I just feel it's important to say this at the beginning, is that my identity as an African-American is rooted firmly in my experiences and the experiences mm -hmm. of my mother and father who were unable to live in a white neighborhood in Philadelphia, but who the black community generally accepted. Mm. And so you can imagine racism in America is not confined to the South, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to treat it that way. But as anyone knows, if even if you study Dr. King, he, he tells you that the racism he experienced in Chicago was worse than what he got in Mississippi and Alabama and other places in the deep south. So for me, growing up in Philadelphia, I had experiences with racism just from where I lived in the city. We lived in an African-American community because the white community would not accept a family uh, with an African-American father and a white mother. Mm. And so I grew up in a, in a very sort of I say middle class, working class, black community. Right. Uh, I, my father was a jazz musician. My mother was a homemaker. I was mm. raised in the 1970s. So mm. I'm a 70s kid, mm -hmm. uh, born in the late 60s, raised in, in the 1970s. So I grew up there and went to high school there and then went off to college not far from where I grew up at Westchester mm. University of Pennsylvania. And it was there that I discovered my love for philosophy. Oh. Uh, and, and so I, I took a philosophy course when I was an undergraduate and I was fascinated because we read Plato's Republic. Okay. And after reading that text, I declared a minor in philosophy and I actually wanted to be a double major. My major was criminal justice. Okay. And, but I was, I had, I was on a scholarship when I was in college and my scholarship was about to run out. So mm -hmm. I pretty much had to graduate and I didn't have time to finish uh, a BA in philosophy. But I wow. did tell myself that if I ever had the opportunity to do so, I would one day go back to graduate school and get a PhD in philosophy. It ended up working out that way, which for me was, was quite nice. So after I finished uh, college. I went to law school in Houston, Texas at the mm -hmm. Thurgood Marshall School of Law. I'm very mm -hmm. proud of my HBCU background. 
I should say that were it not for historically black colleges and universities and their law schools, I would not be a lawyer today. I applied to 11 law schools. I was accepted by three and they were all HBCUs. Wow. And and I, I chose to go to Texas Southern because of the wonderful legacy of Thurgood Marshall that's Mm. there. Um, I don't know, this is a bit of history. A lot of people may not know, but Texas Southern University was founded in 1947 as a result of a a federal court order during desegregation litigation Mm. where the NAACP was representing a black man named Heman Sweat who had applied to the University of Texas Law School and was denied admission because he was black. His Mm -hmm. lawyer, was named Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> he was represented by a young lawyer from the NAACP named Thurgood Marshall. That's right. So the federal court ordered that during the pendency of the litigation that the Texas legislature had to found a, found a university that would train African-Americans in pharmacy and in law. And so in 1947, it was founded as the Texas State University for Negroes. Mm. In 1951, it was renamed Texas Southern University. And in 1976, when Justice Thurgood Marshall was sitting on the Supreme Court in a special ceremony, the law school was renamed in his honor. And so that narrative, that backstory, as an African-American growing up in Philadelphia and coming into that uh, that sort of history was very important to me. And so I chose to go to law school there. I wanted to go to law school because my goal as a lawyer was to represent indigent criminal defendants. I went to law school because I wanted to be a public defender. And so when I finished law school in the early 90s, 93, I came back to Philadelphia. I had a job as a public defender Mm -hmm. and I worked at the Defender Association of Philadelphia for two years. And then I left and I had my own law practice where I did court appointed indigent criminal defense work for about 12 years. Wow. During this time, as you might imagine, almost, I would say 90 to 95% of my clientele was African-American and Latino. Mm. And criminal defense lawyers make no doubt, uh, you know, there should be no doubt about it, are really foot soldiers in the battle against oppression in the criminal justice system. Mm. The arguments that have to be made, the maneuverings that have to happen, the, the passion for advocacy on behalf of one client after another who's black and brown and who's facing uh, significant amounts of time in prison because of mandatory minimum sentencing. Mm-hmm. All of these things became part and parcel of who I am, not just as a, who I was, not just as a lawyer, but who I am as a person. Mm-hmm. So um, there was a time when uh, at that time I was married and I decided that It was very stressful for me and my wife at the time. So we decided that uh, we would try something different, that I would try a different career. Mm. So this was a chance for me to think about uh, transitioning from the practice of law into being a full-time college professor. Mm. Because the practice of law, at least in a city like Philadelphia, the nation's fifth largest city, is feast or famine. Some months you make a lot of money, some months you don't. Yeah. And when you're married and you have financial, <laughs> I don't need to, right, right. I don't need to say anymore, yeah, do I, bro? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You know, you, you have do to do what you have to do. And mm-hmm. and I, what I really needed was a salary. I needed some good benefits. <laughs> and so, in the interest, in the interest of of you know, not, not in the interest of becoming rich, because if I wanted to be rich, I wouldn't have gone to grad school in philosophy. I can tell you that. Right. But. But in the interest of just some financial stability and some flat out predictability in my in the financial sphere of my life, I went back to school, graduate school. I got a master's degree and then I got a Ph.D. from the University of Memphis. And so it's interesting because when I was at the University of Memphis, I want to circle back to my uh, my racial background, because this became uh, one of my first publications uh, was in well. Yeah, one of my yeah, one of my first publications about four years ago. Actually, it was further along than my first publication, but in any okay. event, four years ago, I published an essay in a book called Philosophy in the Mixed Race Experience. Mm. And it was after I finished my dissertation, and this is to all of the, the graduate students out there, right? right. <laughs> after I finished my dissertation, 
when I was going through the final edits to submit it to the graduate school and I finished it, I looked at it and I realized, wait a minute, my, my dissertation covers African-American philosophy. Mm -hmm. There's Germans in my dissertation. Mm -hmm. There's a Jew in my dissertation. <laughs> There's a Protestant in my dissertation. Right. And I took a look at it and I said, this dissertation is as much about my own identity wow. as it is about philosophical texts. Mm -hmm. And so what I started to see is that in my own, in my philosophical work, I'm not so much engaged, I'm engaged as much in an interpretation of myself mm. as I am of any sort of text that purports to be independent of who I really am, right? Mm. So I wrote an essay for a book chapter for that text, Philosophy in the Mixed Race Experience, called, it's titled German Chocolate, Why Philosophy is So Perfect. <laughs> and as, as a part of that, I address uh, a critique of, of whites and some Afri some blacks who would say to me, when you identify as African-American, you're excluding your white mother. And so mm. what I had to do was spend some time doing some preliminary work in that essay, addressing that problem and sort of explaining my rationale for identifying myself as African-American. And what that came down to is that if you're, if you're white and you tell me I'm excluding my white mother, that's that's really a racist sort of way to engage with me on that subject okay. because okay. you certainly aren't going to accept me as a white person, mm. right? You're not going to accept me as a white person. And now you tell me not to identify as a black person. Mm. And so in that part of the chapter, I engaged uh, what uh, William Wells Brown with his character Clotel calls the tragic mulatto problem. Uh -huh. um, and I tried to address that in terms of distancing myself from the tragedy and embracing my African-American identity, because that's the only identity that I've really known. Right. That's the only community that's ever really embraced me. Mm -hmm. my, father was a, my father was a black man. I lived in a black neighborhood. All my friends were black growing up. Mm -hmm. And so for me, my in, in, in resistance to this sort of pernicious movement of whiteness, mm. um, I, what I have to do or what I, what I did in that essay was try to show, listen, uh, this doesn't diminish my mother whatsoever. Mm -hmm. What it does is it gives me an opportunity to almost like Douglas does in his fight with Covey to resist something that's trying to destroy him, to resist okay. something okay. that's trying to tell me that my identity has to be in some sort of in-between zone. And the fact of the matter is it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So I, I choose, I make a choice um, in an existential sense. I make a choice to be an African-American and to identify myself as such because that's the way that I I have interpreted myself. Not, not in a way like Rachel Dolezal, right? We're not, <laughs> right. We're not talking about that. But right. in a in a sort of authentic way, mm -hmm. um, almost in the sense that Frederick Douglass, who opens up his narrative with in part with the statement that his father was a white man, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, okay. Booker T. Washington says something similar, and there were other slaves who came along who were of mixed parentage, and so um, just for those graduate students out there, particularly if you're African American and you're in the humani if you're in the humanities. One of the things that I want you to understand is that sometimes you might be interpreting yourself. You know, this this sort of deeply modern uh, dialectic between text and self, such mm -hmm. that we see self as something separate from its interpreter, is problematic in some ways. And in that essay, German Chocolate, I try to explore that. I see one of the comments coming in. Frederick mm -hmm. Douglass was a pure race man, regardless of his mixed parentage. I, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, I think that there's no doubt that Douglass is certainly embracing his blackness. And, and that's what I have decided to do. And that's the way that I live my life. I try to live my life okay. authentically okay. and honestly, uh, with a keen eye toward my own history and my own identity 
and and how I know myself and how I understand myself. And so um, that was one of my earlier essays about four years ago. Mm -hmm. Since then, uh, I went through a lot of personal trauma. And here's where I have to give a lot of love to Dr. Tommy Curry, Mm -hmm. uh, because as you know, Hassan, his book, The Man Not, has really hit the academic lands- landscape mm-hmm. with, a, with a bang. And right. Right. when I, you know, every now and then there's a book that comes along that speaks to who, not only who we are as academics, mm-hmm. but Dr. Curry's book spoke to me on a personal level. Right. Because when I read the first chapter, what I began to see that a lot of the diff- was that a lot of the difficulties that I had experienced as a result of the trauma I went through in my marriage were because I had an inadequate conceptual scheme that did not enable me to articulate my pain and my suffering as a black man. Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. as Dr. Curry points out, so much of gender studies has been equated with women's studies. Absolutely. And the study of men has been excluded. And then when you add on top of that, what Dr. Curry calls the disciplinary surveillance of the concept of race, such that it becomes diminished in the context of gender. Now, as a black man, I have no way to articulate my pain and my Mm -hmm. suffering, which puts me in a very difficult position of being unable to be seen as a victim of any trauma. Right. And the pathologizing of black men that goes on in popular culture Mm -hmm. ad nauseum, Mm -hmm. even with the death of recent tragic death of Kobe Bryant, you have women trying to paint him as a rapist. And all that does is it prevents, it prevents black people from grieving. Absolutely. Right? From, from grieving that, that loss. And so for me, uh, the man not became the impetus. I, I like to say, I said this on Twitter last week, that Dr. Curry's work, the man not, did for me what David Hume's skepticism did for Emmanuel Kant. Yeah, it, I did catch that, it, yeah. It, it awakened me from my dogmatic slumber, okay. and it turned my thoughts in an entirely new direction. And so now... Uh, you know, the, the, the dogmatic slumber that I was in was the dogmatic slumber of an unnuanced, uncritically accepted notion of patriarchy mm-hmm. that, as Dr. Curry points out, wrongly suggests that black men and white men want the same thing. Absolutely. And the lack of historical knowledge, the lack of historical nuance with respect to first, second and third wave feminism has resulted in a certain ease with which black men are always already path pathologized. Absolutely. They're always put in a situation where they become a a problem and they be, thus become incapable of being seen as a victim. And so for me, when I read The Man Not a couple of years ago, I, it led me to start thinking really hard about my own experience as a black man, not only as a black man, but as a black man who happened to be a Christian. Okay. And so Christianity has a way of complicating black male identity, Mm -hmm. particularly when black pastors who are not as learned in history as they ought to be, stand in the pulpit and recite tropes to black men like you have to man up. There's something wrong with you. You're not responsible. You know, Dr. Johnson, I'll tell you this, man. I grew up in a community of black men, starting with my father, Mm -hmm. who were anything but irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Every man I knew in my community was a responsible, hardworking black man. That doesn't mean they were perfect. Right. My father was not perfect. But what it does mean is that the cachet behind these stereotypes that tell us that we are all pathologized Mm -hmm. is deeply problematic because we are not. My father was not just my father. He was, he was a friend. He was everything Mm -hmm. a father was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And 
And so despite all of his imperfections, right? Again, no one's perfect, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I when I think about the way in which these tropes that we have, mm -hmm. right? The black rapist, mm -hmm. we have, uh, you know, all the hypersexualization of black men, that kind of stuff is recast in pulpits as uh, moral people. Absolutely. And now, and now you have a black man who is part of a faith community, mm -hmm. particularly a Christian community, right? Who sees as the central figure of the Christian experience, a racialized man in the person of Jesus Christ, okay. right? If we, if we take black theology seriously, mm -hmm. and if we take people like James Cone seriously, seriously right. um, then he identifies what he calls the blackness of God, mm. not necessarily making an ontological or a historical claim, mm -hmm. but rather making an existential claim that God identifies himself with the experiences of oppressed persons. Okay. And so in so far as God does that for African Americans, God is black. Okay. And so in a black theology of liberation, Dr. Cohn spends a lot of time developing this notion of what he calls the blackness of God. So now, now wait a minute, one second. I, I do want to shout out thanks to Antonio, definitely thanks to Black Outcast Media for uh, donating, thanks to TD Hip Hop Media for sharing the video right now as we go along. So good looking out people. Um, I wanted to back up a little bit because I do want you to continue with what you're talking about, but you have two major areas of contention really for black men that you, you've you gone through at least. I mean, it, just if you took philosophy and the church, those two by themselves yes. are extremely powerful because I myself was a philosophy major in undergrad. Um, and I was I was thinking about doing a law degree. I was thinking about becoming a philosophy professor. I think I was seduced by the class discussions and debates. And matter of fact, I took so many classes. I wasn't even trying to major. They just said, hey, man, if you take one more, you got a second major. I was like, oh, you know, so it, philosophy can be extremely seductive. But talk a little bit about how you navigated that as well as the church, because it sounds to me like Curry, uh, if you could have had the man not you know, in undergrad, even as a philosophy, you know, when you were taking philosophy, it sounds like that might have done for you what Cone did uh, for religion. It might have been an easier way to kind of enter into, but you nonetheless navigated that, uh, you know, before, you know, the man not. So how did you navigate those waters in philosophy? And, and is there a relationship between how you navigate, you know, the church in many respects? Sure. So I think I dealt with philosophy um, by and I'll, at the risk of being sort of sort of oversimplifying this, uh, being a member of a Protestant faith tradition, um, I'm a Seventh Day Adventist, right? So okay. being a member of, of that Protestant faith tradition, a tradition which, by the way, um, is deeply rooted in the racial fractures that led to the Civil War, uh, right? Okay. The Seventh Day Adventist Church was founded in the middle of the Civil War in 1863 and is very much an American religious denomination and has had to grapple with the problem of racism and from slavery and reconstruction all the way through Jim Crow in the 20th century. And even today, uh, there's still deep fissures in the church as it relates to race relations. So um, that, that said, I think that for me, my navigation of philosophy with uh, with my faith is is sort of something that I looked at through. I, I found a I found a philosophical theological home in Kierkegaard. Okay. Uh, as an undergraduate, and so what I came to see is this uh, this notion that anyone who purports to be able to explain God in rational terms because that is what philosophy demands, right? Philosophy okay. demands a rational explanation and justification according to the logos or reason, mm. right? So philosophy wants to, through its projects of metaphysics and ontology and epistemology, its principal aim is to know and to grasp and to understand. Mm. Whereas the Christian theological tradition uh, recognizes reason or the logos but makes the point that um, 
the logos for the Christian is not the end of or the goal of our experience, but rather is only the beginning. Mm. So the one of the famous passages in the scriptures in the Bible is John 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Mm -hmm. That term in the Greek there is logos, which of course means reasons, wor reason, word, or language. Mm. But then when you go to verse 14, it says, and the word was made flesh. And so for me, um, as a Christian, I've always sort of understood my task not so much to try to navigate philosoph navigate my Christianity through the labyrinth of philosophical abstraction, mm -hmm. right? Which I think is a non-starter because at its core, there's nothing about Christianity that is rational, okay. right? Um, and this is not to say that Christianity uh, makes me anti-intellectual, mm -hmm. but it is to say in some sense that I recognize uh, that Christianity uh, rightly conceived, I think, recognizes that there are certain intellectual limitations, mm. right? That there is an epistemic hubris that comes with philosophy that has to sort of subside um, if you make certain claims to belief in the Christian tradition. Okay. And for me, I have always tried to make my Christianity more about the flesh than about the word. So mm -hmm. when it comes to things like the oppression of the poor, like criminal justice reform, right? Like the, the history, the, the tortured history in America of black men from, from Jim, black men and women from Jim Crow to lynching, to voting rights and so forth. All of those things I've always seen as very much within the purview of my Christian identity. And so for me, I consider my work as a philosopher to be metaphilosophical. Okay. That is to say, my research focuses on philosophical questions about philosophy in the normative sense. Mm -hmm. That is to say, what kinds of questions should philosophy be trying to address? Mm -hmm. And so much of my work from from my my book, uh, my book on onto theology, and my book on Douglas and the philosophy of religion are metaphilosophical in that they they make the claim that philosophy and its task of abstraction has never been good for black people. Okay. When when white people start abstracting, they start <laughs> erasing history, right? right? Charles Mills talks about this in the racial contract, mm -hmm. where he argues very strenuously that the thought experiments of John Rawls, for example, mm. are these extrapolations and abstractions that lead us to this original position where nobody knows their history, mm. nobody knows their identity, right? Mm -hmm. And Charles Mills makes the poignant observation in one of his papers from about 11 years ago called Rawls on Race, Race and Rawls, that the real problem with the abstractions of political philosophy is that not only do they end up not addressing racial oppression, but because of their neglect of history, they likely end up perpetuating it. Mm. And, and so philosophy for me has always been a sort of dangerous endeavor insofar as when it's done, as it's generally conceived to be done, uh, the history of oppression, black identity, et cetera, all becomes obliterated in the interest of the most abstract generalities right. that will do nothing to address the problem of oppression, but will instead sustain it and worsen it. And so that's how I tried to deal with uh, philosophy. Well, I wanted to, to quickly shout out, uh, thanks uh, to Rodney Jackson for uh, donating to the pot. Uh, we got a question from Black Outcast Media, and he asked, Dr. Golden, what is the key question that you think philosophy can answer for us, brothers? And alongside that question, what I was going to ask is, how in that did you start to, you know, move your work toward dealing with black men? Uh, one of the things I noticed about both the university and the church is that both are actually, in terms of numbers, uh, the predominant, you know, populations 
uh, for both are women. Um, and so, you know, it, there's usually, especially in a church setting where you can see a shift in the language in regard to who's in the room, who are the majority of people engaging in the different groups and different subcommittees, so on and so forth. So for in, in both of these environments, it becomes a very purposeful act to say, okay, I want to fixate on black males in some way, shape, or form. How did you come to that in your work? So I want you to start with Black Outcast question in uh, regard to uh, philosophy and black men, but then you know, tell us how you made that that shift. What 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 kind of pushed you there? Sure. So as to the question, I think what philosophy has to do is make an existential turn. It has to turn away from its preoccupation with abstract metaphysical, ontological, and epistemological questions, and instead begin to address not only questions of praxis, but questions of identity, questions mm -hmm. of struggle, questions that can be viewed through Dr. Curry's conceptual scheme mm -hmm. of the man not, mm -hmm. through what it means to be an African-American man. We need to move uh, away from the abstractions of philosophy, because as I said a moment ago, abstraction is never good for black people. Mm -hmm. It never has been and it never will be. In mm -hmm. fact, abstraction is the basis for this false notion of colorblindness, right? Um, and so philosophy, I think, if it's going to address questions of black manhood and black masculinity, it has to make a turn away from ontology, epistemology, and metaphysics, and it has to make an existential turn toward questions of embodiment, racial embodiment, um, and, and gender embodiment, and it has to make a turn toward questions of identity. Mm -hmm. Now, your can you restate your second question? Well, the uh, second Dr. question is is how you how you got to I mean how you decided to yes. focus your work on yeah. black men. Sure. And, that's, and sure. I ask that because that's not that's not something that's rewarded in the academy. So it, no. it usually takes a very purposeful gesture on one's part to do that. How did that happen yeah. with you? It happened with me because, as I mentioned in my TED talk, I was led to the brink of suicide. Mm -hmm. I was probably just a few short weeks away from killing myself, and one of the reasons I was so close to doing that was because I felt trapped. Okay. I turned to certain um, elements in the church and I couldn't find uh, a place where I could reach out. I mm -hmm. felt like the dogmas of religion had constricted me and mm. uh, told me that I had to remain in, a, in an abusive marriage wow. that was literally killing me inside. Wow. And so because I was so caught up in the religious doctrine and in the religious dogma, I began thinking to myself, well, I'm going to be miserable if I stay married. Right. And if I get divorced, I'm going to experience a social death that is all but certain. Yes. And neither, and neither of these two alternatives are good. Absolutely. And so the only way out is to end my life. And and I was there, man. I mean, when I tell you I was there, I brother, it was so close it was frightening. Mm -hmm. And and so for me, what what led me to the study of black men was after reading Curry's work, The Man Not, I saw my conundrum. Mm -hmm. I saw that I couldn't really articulate what I was experiencing. Absolutely. And when I began to see Curry's development and mm -hmm. his trenchant critique mm -hmm. of gender studies as it's currently constituted, mm -hmm. I now had a voice yeah. and a space. Yeah. And Dr. Curry had cleared the ground and made a place for me to lay a foundation mm -hmm. where I could actually have the audacity, Dr. Johnson, as a black man for some self-determination absolutely, and for some self-interpretation, right? And then when I began to see how cults, cause I had, I had always been suspicious of the John legends and <laughs> of all of the people who decide to jump on the bandwagon and castigate black men. And I was, I didn't really care for Barack Obama's 
uh, address at Morehouse right. College, right. Where he was president, right. mm-hmm. the, the moralizing, yes. the lecturing, yes. the you got to do better, mm-hmm. the, the all of the respectability politics. Right. I, 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 that always bothered me. Mm-hmm. But Dr. Curry gave me an actual conceptual scheme mm-hmm. to really resist that kind of thinking. Absolutely. And his analysis of the cultural phenomena had has really, really put me on track. So what I began to do is I began to think to myself, I, I, after my TED Talk, I've spoken at men's conferences affiliated with my church. Okay. And man, I can't, I can't tell you how many brothers have come up to me yeah. and have said to me, listen, man, you know, yeah. what you're saying is what I have been through, but yeah. I'm afraid to say anything because nobody's going to pay me any attention. Yeah, real. I mean, what, what, right? you're, what you're pointing to, you know, there's two things that come out of that. One, there's the need for a vocabulary. And I think yes. what Dr. Curry represents is a shift, particularly with black male scholars, where we're actually attempting to create the vocabulary to help us articulate our own experiences. So this is where you get anti-black misandry as a concept, right? You know, how yes. under black male studies and, and yeah. why I'm pushing for black masculinism is because I'm, we're trying to create the concepts, the terms so that we can articulate ourselves. Because when we don't, I think your story, and again, I urge people to go check out your TED Talk. Um, that story is rife with what vocabulary can do in a liberating sense. I mean, mm-hmm. you're standing at the precipice of life and death and just being able to articulate yourself is a huge shift in, in how you navigated that. That's exactly. I mean, And that, I think that's one of the main reasons for that. And I think the second part I was going to add to that is when you do it, you, you help people give uh, give them give permission to themselves to do it as well. Because I started talking about uh, my experience. I, I dealt with experiences of rape under the age of 10. I was violated mm-hmm by a white male when I was about three and then uh, violated by an older black girl when I was probably about eight. And and I would sit in these graduate courses, these gender study courses, and they would talk about rape and sexual assault and violation, but they would always talk about it strictly from the standpoint of men to women. They never talked about male victimization. They never talked. And I didn't have a language for it. You know what I mean? You know, Dr. Johnson, here's something that a lot of brothers will find interesting. When I was really at rock bottom, I needed a clinical intervention. So mm-hmm. I saw therapy. Okay. And I didn't even really know how to describe what I was going through because the yeah. paradigm of abuse is that the man is the abuser and that the woman is always the victim. Yep. So yep. when I when I, I stumbled across a few websites that talked about uh, men being emotionally abused and harmed. And then now all of a sudden I'm able to give what I'm experienced. I'm give, able to give a name to what yeah. I'm experiencing. Mm-hmm. So I was calling around to ask some therapists if they dealt with abused men. And I had to make about seven or eight phone calls, man. Yeah. I mean, I was calling yeah. around. I had one therapist laugh at me yeah. and said, abused yeah. men, men yeah. can't be abused. You see that? And so, and, and and we haven't even talked about facing this as an African American man, yeah. right? As yeah. a black man from a very toxic uh, religious culture mm. that pathologizes him on top of the societal pathologies, right? right. Uh, right. And so, so right. there are these layers of dysfunction that have to be cut through. And after some hard work and continual persistent searching, fortunately, I was able to find a therapist who said, yes, I deal with abused men. Mm. Uh, Yes. And so that was a godsend because it really was helpful for me and has uh, has become uh, something integral in my healing. But my my journey into black male studies is through the door of the concept of the man not and how that concept plays itself out in black ecclesial communities. Mm. And I'm interested in uh, exegetical and hermeneutical reform because what we hear from black pulpits, from black pastors is little more 
than half-baked academic theories that they get on social media that mm. pathologize black men. And then those same pathologies are recast in the pulpit as divine imperative. Ooh. And so as a black man who sees a black Jesus Ooh. that was innocent and was nailed to a cross and had to die in order for someone to be saved, I go to church and I hear the preacher tell me the same thing that society tells me. And mm. so now I begin to think that my relationships are a zero sum game. So mm. if my wife is going to be happy, that means mm. I gotta suffer like yes, Christ. Sir. Yes, sir. Right? Mm -hmm. And I'm interested as a black man who is a Christian, I'm interested in the genesis of and the maintenance of that dysfunction, mm. which I think has to be completely dismantled and replaced with what I believe is a robust philosophical theology of history that is attentive to the conditions and circumstances of black men, particularly black men in America. Because when I think when we see that, now it becomes easy to see whiteness at work in feminism. Mm -hmm. It becomes mm -hmm. easy to see how whiteness moves through feminist tropes and demonizes black men and really partakes in the legacy of lynching of black men and hypersexualizing of black men that Ida B. Wells argued against mm. so vociferously in her work, okay. right? And, and when we see that, now all of a sudden, maybe what gets preached from the pulpit isn't that black men are a problem, but maybe it's black men are in need of humanity. Black men need to be heard. Yes. Black men need to be respected as men. Mm -hmm. And so the, the very simple thing, and I'm thinking here of what Dr. King did during the garbage worker strike in Memphis in 1968, they wore signs, Dr. Johnson, mm. and the signs just said, I am a man. Right. That's right. all they said. Right. And these were black men. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These were hardworking black men who were trying to make a living for their families and who were completely disrespected. And there's far too many black men in black Christian churches, uh, particularly in America, who get browbeaten at work mm. and then they come to church and they get browbeaten again. And then they're told that the central figure of their religion died even though he was innocent. He was mistreated, even right. though he was innocent. Right. And and so black men are told in churches, it's not about how you feel. And there's a very mm -hmm. toxic theology yes. that perpetuates the neglect of the inner emotional lives of black men. And that is what I'm interested in and what I hope to change with a current book chapter that I'm working on. So. It, it, it comes from my own experience and is profoundly augmented by and, and really grounded in Dr. Curry's concept of the man not. Well, tell me uh, uh, when I want to shout out cats for supporting the channel. Thank you. Um, you talk about the particular types of emotional abuse you experienced at the hands of your wife. Can you talk a little bit for black men, especially or anybody really, but particularly black men who may not know what types of emotional abuse uh, they, they experience. And I say that because many of us experience it and without a vocabulary, we just keep experiencing it. But once you actually look at the definitions you, and you think about it, you find that you've been subject to some of these things for quite a while. They've only just been framed in terms of what women experience. So if you wouldn't mind, can you talk to us a little bit about the emotional abuse? And you talk about it in your TED talk. Um, mm -hmm. that you experience and what men should be aware of in terms of, you know, how emotional abuse works. Mm -hmm. So here's the things to keep in mind. Um, most, uh, most narcissists are styled as men, mm -hmm. but in the age of Beyonce and in the age of uh, sort of black women owning their sexuality mm -hmm. uh, in black feminism. I'm not suggesting anything is wrong with that. But in the age of that, one of the things that ends up happening 
is that some women will end up weaponizing their sexuality and they will end up using it in intimate partner relationships like marriage mm -hmm. in a way that is completely denigrating to the esteem and well-being of their husbands. Mm. So I'll give you an example. In, in my instance, and I talk about this a little bit in the TED Talk, in my instant relationship with my former spouse was so toxic precisely because she made certain aesthetic demands on okay. me okay. What, about what she needed to be sexually excited, right? Okay. Sexually or physical appearance. Now, I'm a large mm. man and I've really struggled with my weight throughout most of my life. It's never been an easy struggle. Um, and so what would happen, and this is a dynamic I would like brothers to be on the lookout for, is most abusers, particularly emotional abusers, mm -hmm. will have two faces. There will be a public face right. and there will be a private face. Mm -hmm. And what will happen, and what happened in my case was publicly, my ex-wife would talk to others and she would talk to others about my weight in terms of my health. Okay. Right, right. And she would she so would say, I want found it altruistic, be, right? Right, right, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. I want him to be healthy and so forth right. and so on. Mm -hmm. But every time she presented it to me. It was about her inability to achieve sexual arousal because of what I looked like. Wow. And so publicly, another part of the public face for an abusive relationship is that the abuser will be effusive with their praise uh -huh. to others about you. Right. Right. But privately, they will not treat you that way. Yes. And what ends up happening is when you when your private treatment is at such a contrast with your public treatment mm -hmm. because the abused person hears all of the love and all of the support publicly mm -hmm. right despite how you feel because of what's said to you privately mm -hmm. you start to think to yourself well maybe i am wrong mm -hmm. maybe she really does love me mm -hmm. because i hear all the things she says but it's in that moment dr johnson that we experience the destabilization that is gaslighting, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So now, as a, as a man in that situation, you're literally questioning your sense of what's real. Exactly. You're not sure, right? Mm -hmm. You're not really sure of the truth of the situation. You know how you feel, mm -hmm. but you tend to be partly because, in my case, I'm a member of a Christian community mm -hmm. that tells me my feelings don't matter. Sure. Right? Sure. <laughs> my feelings don't matter. So I end up disregarding my internal alarm system because I really believe that the emotions are intended to be our, our alarm system, right? Mm -hmm. They tell us when something is wrong, mm -hmm. our emotion, our intuition. And if you heard your smoke detector go off in the middle of the night, right. you wouldn't ignore it, right. would you? Right. <laughs> you know, you would get up and see what was happening. And so, but what happens is the church, particularly the black church, right? Mm. Because there's a lot of very toxic uh, interpretations of masculinity in the black community that stigmatize mental health issues, that stigmatize in the black Christian community Anything outside of prayer, if you're not praying or if you're not spiritualizing your problem away, that's somehow of the devil and so forth. And what I'm saying is that there are times when that's flat out wrong. There are yeah. times when you do have to trust your feelings. There are times when you do have to trust your intuition. And I ignored mine for so long that I didn't, toward the end, the only thing that got me sure on what was real was that I began to pay much more attention to how I felt. Okay. And I knew that my feelings were trying to tell me that something was terribly wrong. Well, and, and that, so, but that's a revolutionary yeah. act unto itself to prioritize and even allow yourself to focus on your feelings because we're told we're not supposed to do that. Um, now, now, some in the chat are asking, because you mentioned that this was in the context of a black church. Was your wife also black? 
Yes, yes, okay. she was. So you were you were experiencing this, and the way she kind of framed it, one of the first things that came to mind when you mentioned how she had the public face and the private one, if and when you decided to, you know, even publicly say, I'm, you know, I have an issue with my wife, or even it gets out that you guys are getting divorced, the way her public face has framed the discussion, you look ungrateful. You look like you're not you're not willing to accept this altruistic loving being, but really what she's done is kind of stack the public against you in a particular way. Where if you attempt to break free, you're the problem. If you call attention to her abuse, you're the problem. You know, it's ways that we use the public, or some people use the public in their own interests uh, to kind of do that. And so that's definitely uh, uh, you know part of the abusive dynamic too. But I, I, I appreciate you talking about that because. I think so many black men experience that we just I think we've 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 accepted it as uh, many of us have accepted it as a norm and 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 without the vocabulary again to really begin to break that down we don't we, we leave it alone uh, even when we read I mean I mean I read about rape and and I even wrote about rape in my work and sexual assault and all but the terms were so ensconced in women and gender studies yep it never yep. dawned on me that they applied to me. And I remember sitting in a graduate course as they were talking about rape and thinking, wait a minute, I've experienced a number of those things. And, and I said something along those lines, it is probably about 15 years ago. And I remember, you know, immediately being silenced, you know, particularly mm -hmm. by the women in the class, because they had, they, they had already been empowered with a certain type of connection to the data, connection to the concepts. And I didn't have enough uh, at the time to really push back against that. So I just kind of accepted it. But I think what you're speaking to is what happens uh, when we don't know, we don't take the, we don't make the effort to do that and to do that and to connect with those who are doing the work uh, like yourself, like Dr. Curry, like Dr. Neal, people who are putting out work that says, hey, wait a minute, there's something else going on here. So, you know, when we, we mentioned Kobe a little while ago, the, the importance of us speaking out about how he's being regarded, how he's being treatment, treated is imperative because he and others are being used to reflect on all black men. And we That's again, right. we're so used to it. We don't critically often break that down. But we, but I'm hearing more and more women, more and more men who are starting to speak up. And I think once you get this vocabulary, once you get some of these concepts and terms under your belt, it only adds that much more. Because there's so much in the black male experience that 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 is is framed in this type of trauma, this type of ongoing assault, that we've just taken it as a norm in many ways. You know, we we have, and we've we've come to accept uh, so much of this, and and we, and it plays itself out in in funny ways, man. I listen to a lot of Christian men in the church talk, and you know, there's a lot of self-deprecating humor and. Oh, my wife's so much smarter than me. Oh, and, yeah. Oh, happy wife, you know, happy life. Thing. Yeah, man. That kind of stuff is, that kind of stuff will kill you, man. <laughs> it is, that is poison. <laughs> and, and, you know, the culture, the culture doesn't help it any, man. You had guys mm -hmm. like, you know, Steve Harvey, man. I think the best thing that happened to black men was him, his show being put off the air. Oh, because, wow. yeah. You know, a lot of the stuff, he, men are stupid. We're stupid. Mm -hmm. We're all hunters. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of, you know, as the woman, you're the prize. Well, as a man, what am I? Right. You know, am I top liver? Do I matter? Right. Do, am I important at all? And I think what we do, you know, Chris Rock made a statement a couple of years ago where he said in substance that only women, children and dogs are loved unconditionally. Men are loved on the condition that they provide something. And what has happened in the black community <laughs> is and it's and it's reinforced in black churches that there is somehow a virtue in reducing black masculinity mm -hmm. to the quality of your credit score yeah, and the yes. amount of money that you have yes. in your bank account yes so that you can provide and do as christ has done which means mm -hmm. that in order for your family to be saved you have to die and that is a recipe wow. for emotional and psychological disaster. So if I could, if I could hitch my wagon to one star, man, as my work relates to to black men, 
I'm, I'm really interested in this problem of the man not in black Christian spaces. And what I hope to do is expand this into a full length book project mm -hmm. uh, where my point of departure would be uh, the, the gospel story of Jesus who finds a man who was born blind okay. and his disciples say to him, who sinned, this man or his parents? Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about that question, you know, there's an assumption that there's something wrong with this man, that this man mm -hmm. is somehow pathological, mm -hmm. right? And, and what do we do when society looks at us as black men and says, you must have done something wrong? I saw right. a video going around social media last week of a woman slapping a man back and forth across his face. And the comments from yeah. guys and women up and down the feed are things like, Go, girl. He must have done something he wrong. He must have done he something. Must, you know, you you just getting him for something. And see that sort that presumption of guilt. You know, I spent my I've spent my legal career fighting for the presumption of innocence. Yes. For oppressed yes. black men and women, and in philosophy and theology, I now have to fight against the presumption of guilt. Right. There's this there's this presumption that all black men are somehow pathological, right. that there's something wrong with us, right. that our inclination is to a greater degree than white men bent on hypersexual yes. uh, behavior, that we're rapists, that we're always already uh, ensconced conceptually as criminals. I think it was Fanon who said that black men are dangerously ahead of themselves. I'm, yeah. I'm present even when I'm absent, right? Mm. So that when George Zimmerman sees Trayvon Martin, right. he's already brought within this violent conceptual scheme and understood mm -hmm. as criminal, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. it becomes easy to kill him because he's not human, mm -hmm. he's a criminal. And mm -hmm. so my work with black men uh, in philosophy is an attempt to address the, the real problems of black identity in the black male identity in the context of black Christian spaces, which I think are, mm. are in desperate need of reform. Mm. Wow. Powerful. We had a question uh, a little ways back in the, in the chat uh, where somebody asked about how black men can navigate these universities uh, and the university experience. And I think a lot of what you just said speaks to how how you know it's not just it, it's not just in the larger society or even in the church we know it's in the academy so in, in terms of what you might suggest to somebody who's looking to go through this university experience what insight might you give about how they should navigate it i would say that if you're going to navigate this experience the intellectual demands and you notice dr johnson the intellectual rigor of doctoral study and mm -hmm. the pursuit of graduate degrees and so forth is is taxing. And mm -hmm. the first thing I would say is you have to be serious about it. Right. You have to be serious about it and you have to determine that this is what you're going to do. You also have to not you have to not only be serious, but you have to be prepared, mm -hmm. which means you have to seek the collective wisdom of black men and women mm -hmm. who have gone before you. Mm -hmm. Before I went back to graduate school, I sat in front of my computer, man, and I sent emails to just about every black philosopher that I, I could to mm. ask their questions, ask questions of them, ask their opinions and so forth. So you have to be serious. You have to be prepared. Yeah. And and you have to be committed to your own work. You have to believe in your own work. You have to believe that your work is meaningful, that you have something to say and that when you say it, it will make a difference. Yeah. So I would say those three things: you have to be, uh, you have to be prepared, you have to be committed, and I'm forgetting the third thing I said. You have to be. What did was it, What did I say? <laughs> it escapes me now. But <laughs> uh, so it'll come back to me. But you got to be. You got to be prepared. You got to be committed, and and you just have to know. That you have to, and you have to believe in yourself. You have Absolutely. to believe that you have something to say, and that what you say is really going to matter. So mm -hmm. um, that would be my advice to anyone, because once you go into it, 
it's it's not always going to be friendly to you. It's going oh, to be hostile. You absolutely. know, graduate school is not. I mean, I had a <laughs> I had a white professor when I was in graduate school. Man, I, I you know I just this is funny. It's a crazy story, but you know. I, here, I, I had when I went back to grad school, I had practiced law for years, man, mm. in, in Philadelphia. Argued in front of juries, judges. I argued cases in front of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Okay, it is. And I'm walking down the hall with this white dude, man, and he, you know, asking me to carry his briefcase. I looked at him. I was like, Nah, man, nah, <laughs> nah, <laughs> like, nah. Right. So you have to. As a brother, you have to know who you are and and you have to know, you know, what you're going to tolerate and what you're not going to tolerate, man. Right. Because they, 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 folk, folk will test you, you know. Right. Folk will test you. But I, right. I just told I said, no, nah, man, I'm not doing that. No. Nah. <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. It, it, yeah. And I would I would say, you know, to anybody going through black males looking to go through graduate school, you definitely got to be self-driven. You got to be you got to be focused. You know, you definitely have to back up your arguments uh, as, as much as possible. And pretty much I go in. I went in um, with the assumption that there weren't a whole lot of allies. There weren't people who were who were jumping out their way to look out for me. Um and so when those people did present themselves, it was icing on the cake and I definitely received them. But for the most part, the majority of my academic experience was, you know, intellectual hostility, cultural hostility, institutional mm -hmm. hostility and, and exclusion. And so you, you, you kind of go in um, not expecting much and making sure you are incredibly prepared uh, on, on, on as many levels as possible, especially emotionally. Because what people don't often talk about is that uh, graduate students, the percentage that attempt and commit suicide are extremely high. Graduate yeah, school is, 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 a, is, a, is a grueling experience, especially when you are unwanted. Uh, and I've experienced that exclusion at the hands of white men, white women, uh, and black women, to be honest with you. So you, you, because in many instances, they end up kind of being in, in black academic or bl spaces, they kind of end up becoming the gatekeepers in some respects. So as a graduate student, I would also say, if you're going to deal with black male studies, uh, be very diplomatic and strategic about how you do it, cite and back up all your research. And, and I'll be honest with you, in, in many instances, you wait till you get tenure before you come out the gate you know, full with full guns blazing, because uh, there's going to be a great deal of animosity uh, from a number of different spaces about advocating for black men. And, and it's right. going to be even hard to tell where those that animosity is going to come from. But it's going to come from a number of different spaces because the protection and, and really the humanizing of black men is unwelcome. Um, That's right. In many, That's in right. And if, I, if I could just piggyback on what you said there, Dr. Oh, Johnson. What I would say too to someone preparing to go to grad school is know the basics of your discipline. Commit to understanding the basics of your discipline before you begin the work of criticism, mm -hmm. right? Because if you don't know your discipline, you're not going to know what you're criticizing. True. And the worst thing you can do is attempt a critique of something that you don't really understand. One of the things that is so impressive about Dr. Curry to me is the immensity of his retention mm -hmm. of material mm -hmm. that is basic to his discipline. Right. He, he understands modern philosophy. Mm -hmm. He understands ancient philosophy. Mm -hmm. He understands social and political philosophy. He understands philosophy of law. And the only way to develop that kind of understanding is to spend time with those basic texts. And then you can begin to develop right. through some of the secondary literature. Right. You can begin to carve out a space where you can stand and speak your own voice. Right. And when right. you do it that way, you do it with so much more credibility. Mm -hmm. Just because you understand something doesn't mean you agree with it, okay. right? Mm -hmm. But I was reading some of Dr. Curry's work a couple of years ago, and I was, you know, I was just taken aback, but not taken aback in a bad way, but in a in a good way, 
by how well he understands the basics of philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. In addition to the complexity of his critique, his critique would not be as powerful as it is unless he first understood the basics of his discipline as well as he does. Absolutely. And that to, that to me is, is another piece of advice I would give to, to any person, any black person going to graduate school mm -hmm. is to commit yourself to learning the basics of your discipline. And, you know, just we could give, if I could give tribute here, Dr. Johnson, all we're talking about is what Kobe did on the basketball court. Right. You know, Be commit yourself to mm -hmm. fundamentals, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Commit yourself to the fundamentals and then you can develop your turnaround jump shot, you know? <laughs> but, but master your craft. Absolutely. Master your craft. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Master mm -hmm. your craft. And and Dr. Curry does that so extremely well mm -hmm. and has really, frankly, set a new standard for me because, uh, you know, one of the other things we might add to this to, to black people who are prospective graduate students is don't get caught up in the problem of disciplinary decadence. Okay. Don't limit okay. yourself to just your own discipline. Mm -hmm. Chances are you're going to have to read material outside of your discipline. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Curry is reading, he's reading sociology, he's reading yeah. psychology, he's reading yeah. education. And that's the hallmark of any good scholar, right? Is that they're not, their knowledge is not going to be limited to the narrow confines mm -hmm. of their discipline, but instead will be broad, broad enough and wide enough and deep enough to the point where they are capable of, of carving out some new ground in ways that really cause people to sit up and take notice. So I would just put that out there. Well, you we, we got a question a moment ago from Ian Graves, and he asked uh, for us to talk a little bit about sexual harassment uh, toward black against black men. Um, and, 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 you know, I don't know if you've if you can speak to that in terms of your personal experience or professionally or both, but can you talk a little bit about what you've come to perceive regarding sexual harassment of black men? Okay, so if we're talking about sexual harassment under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, right, of 1964, which is the traditional way that we do, um, I think sexual harassment in the workplace um, has to be if everything that we do to pay it, pay attention, to be attentive to women and their experiences, we need to start doing a lot of that for men, right? Mm -hmm. So if a woman says that she feels uncomfortable, right, by mm -hmm. something that's said that suggests maybe there needs to be some sort of quid pro quo mm. uh, in order for her to get ahead, uh, those kinds of things can be said to men too. Yes. Um, and and men have to men are always and this is the other problem. Men are always presumed to be ready for sex, mm -hmm. particularly black men mm -hmm. are always presumed to be ready for sex mm -hmm. and are always presumed to desire sex. Right. A man's right. emotional life or his well-being such that, you know, it's hard for us to conceive that a man wouldn't want to have sex with his partner because of emotional estrangement, mm. for example, mm. right? mm. you know, because a black man always wants sex, yeah. right? Yeah. So this sort of hypersexual caricature of black men, I think, um, is part of what we might see in the workplace that could lead to sexual harassment. So mm. I think uh, when we see that kind of stuff played out in the workplace, that's a problem. I can't really speak to sexual harassment mm -hmm. from my own experience. I can um, speak of a case that I had when I was practicing law where there was a man who was a, uh, a corrections officer whose pants of his uniform tore mm -hmm. during his shift, And his female supervisor made him go through the rest of the day with a split in oh, his wow. pants, okay. with his underwear showing, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is the kind of thing that we might call a, a hostile work environment. I mean, that's you know that's quite humiliating, as you might imagine, mm -hmm. particularly in a prison setting. Um, and so I would say that for men and women, 
because we because we are different and because things are seen differently, let me just suggest this, that the, the things that apply to women in the workplace can also apply to men. And the first thing that we have to do is get rid of this toxic idea right. that every black man is always ready for sex. Mm -hmm. and all you have to do is proposition him and he'll want to do it. Like what black man wouldn't want to have sex with a female supervisor to get a promotion? He mm -hmm. gets to have sex and he gets the promotion. Of course, he's going to want that. Right. Uh, so right. I, I can't speak to it from my personal experience other than that one case I told you I had when I was practicing law. But uh, that's what I would say today. I think for me, when I think about sexual harassment, because I actually wrote a blog piece about this a couple of years ago. Uh, I had an experience where, you know, in the classroom, it was assumed that um, I was considered menacing, right? You know, I'm 6'2", 300 pounds. Um, and if I don't have an active smile on my face, it was, so I actually had, uh, you know, students say that she was afraid of me and how I looked. And I wanted to, and one of the things I wrote in the blog piece related to Title IX, as I was pointing out, I actually put up the literature about you know sexual harassment, but what I started to express too is that for black men, we always have to ask the question, and this is the importance of black male studies. We have to ask the question: How do these concepts or policies impact us differently than other groups? How is this different from how women may be impacted? How is this different? And at the end of the day, the notion that people are afraid of black males because of the long-standing stereotypes about black male aggression and hypermasculinity and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. The, the responding to black males out of fear and the accusation that black males may be a threat when there there hasn't been a threat, right? When there, there's there's no evidence that anything has taken place, but the the mere fact that black men can be easily accused and people will believe it on the basis of fear is a form of racial and sexual harassment, particular to black men, because it comes out of a very distinct legacy of black male stereotype about us being these boogeymen. So even subtle things like, because we think of sexual harassment, we think of somebody, you know, making a, a, a joke, a sexual joke, or maybe touching someone's body part. But when you talk about black men, if you actually look at the history of stereotype first as a framework for understanding how black men are thought about in the, in the you know, in the public imagination, then we can actually see that even an act of of, of, of feeling fearful of black men, especially if that trend that, that transgresses into to, uh, treatment on the job, right? If you're let go because somebody is afraid of you, or if you're not allowed a promotion or, you know what I mean? Or, or raise and, and, and you actually have documentation where people are saying that you're scary or you're this, or you're a threat. And there's been no evidence of any of that. That is a very particular form of racial and sexual harassment in regard to black men. So we need to actually be able, but it's hard to do that if we're not able to have that kind of conversation because it really goes back to yeah. vocabulary. You know what I mean? Exactly. It never dawned on me that anytime I got in an elevator with, you know, uh, an a supervisor or whomever and they clutched their purse and stepped back from me, that that might be something that I need to pay attention to on legal grounds based on whether or not an incident may have come forth where I now am being accused of something or I'm, you know what I mean? It never dawned on me to consider that because nobody had ever talked about sexual harassment along those terms. Again, we only talked about it in terms of an environment that makes women uncomfortable. But what happens That's when you're considered a hypersexual book and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, your supervisors who may be women expect sex from you? Like you said in a moment ago, who, who's going to believe you would turn that down? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if it's offered to you, so why would you? But upon being, you know, uh, having somebody extend that to you, uh, whether they assume that you're going to like it or not, that is a form of sexual harassment. But again, yes. that's not how we conceptualize it for women. We don't conceptualize the boss coming up and saying, "I'll, you know, you, you we'll have sex. I'll offer you a promotion." We, we we clearly have a way of looking at that, but if the genders are reversed, we just kind of walk away from it. Um, and, and again, it's in, it's in moments like that, that there are these opportunities for black men to reclaim their humanity from the clutches of these social and cultural stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to come out and to say, 
No, it doesn't always work that way. I can be a black male and yes, the sexual advances of my female boss can actually be unwanted, right? Mm. It's not unreasonable or ludicrous to suggest that one can make unwanted sexual advances toward a man mm. because we, particularly if that man is black, right? Mm. Because black men, the box, we're always ready. Right. right? We're right. always ready for sex. In fact, we're so ready for sex that we have to go around and rape people exactly. in order to get it, right? Exactly. And to show our dominance and to show our control and so <laughs> forth. So I think those are opportunities to reclaim our humanity. I'll also say that one of my mentors, he's now retired, uh, Bill Lawson, mm. wrote an essay uh, some years ago uh, called The Importance of Moral Discourse. And this is in his book on philosophy in American slavery. And one of the things he points to is this very problem of vocabulary, as you put it. Mm -hmm. When you don't have the conceptual scheme that enables you to articulate what you're experiencing, then you're ultimately unable to, to achieve a shared communication experience. Mm -hmm. And thus, we're never able to get to a place where we can actually have meaningful reform, mm. right? At least not in terms of public policy, because think about it, Dr. Johnson, if you go back 60 years, a woman who was being groped on her job by her boss and told that if she didn't give in to his sexual advances, she was going to be fired. She didn't know what to call that wow. 60 years ago, right? She had no name for it. Mm -hmm. But the moment that there was a term, sexual harassment. Now, all of a sudden, that term translates into significant public policy changes right. that now provide a legal infrastructure so that she can interpret her experience now right. in a way that will lead to a redress of her grievance. We exactly. need the same sort of dynamic at work for Black men. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that I think black male studies makes so possible because Absolutely. it's black men, it's black men reflecting on the experiences of black men and not just black men. There may be black women who are in black male studies, right? Mm -hmm. who, Absolutely. Who are doing some of the same work. And like I said at the beginning of my TED talk, I tried to ask people to think about their fathers, about their brothers, about their mm -hmm. nephews, right? Mm -hmm about all the men in their lives, their uncles and so forth. So these are, these are the kinds of things that, uh, that I'm hoping uh, will, will help to shift the culture in a way that, that makes a difference for black men. No, absolutely. And I think it's important um, that we keep that conversation going because it's really just getting started. Uh, I do want to say I'll be interviewing uh, Zakia San Sankara Jabbar uh, I think first week of February, so that should be next Wednesday. When because you mentioned uh, women in Black male studies, and I would definitely uh, suggest that uh, you know people are going to get a, a kick out of what she has to say in relation to that. So I'll be doing that soon. But I I very much agree with you, and I think that you know we definitely have to keep that ball rolling because there's so much fear. Uh, even amongst black male scholars about prioritizing black men and and how they'll be treated in the academy. And, 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 and you'll see a number of them walking on eggshells in, in how we go about it as well for fear of, you know, offending others or frustrating others. But we do have to prioritize, um, you know, the black male experience because it has been excluded. And a moment ago, you also talked about uh, you know, the, the, the vocabulary, the language that women got, uh, particularly in the 1960s and 70s around rape, around sexual assault. And that's a critical period that a lot of people really don't look at the granular aspects of. When the first shelters were being built or being put together for um, abused women to be able to move into, one of the things they found um, was that when they interviewed many of these women, they found that the women gave as good as they got. You know, the, the, the mutuality of, of abuse went both ways. 
But the women actually kind of had to be trained to see themselves as in victimized terms. And this is where Dr. Curry talks a lot about the Duluth model and the man not and how that played a severe role and in, in framing this solely as something men initiate and women experience. But when you look at the, the kind of discussions that went on, many of the women were participatory in the abuse back and forth. So it actually took, I would argue, at least a generation to train women to be able to see how this new vocabulary applied to them. But at the same time, they were training young men, especially, but men in general, to not see themselves as a part of that dynamic. So when we look at boys, for example, who come forward and are asked about whether or not they've been sexually violated, you'll often find in some of these studies that boys will say, well, no. But when you get to the, the, the specific questions about, well, were you penetrated but you know, with a, a finger or a penis or an outside item or whatever, boys will come forward and say, well, yeah, well, why didn't you consider that? Why didn't you say that when we asked you if you'd been raped or violated? And they said, well, that's not what we saw on TV. What we saw in mm. movies and on television was that this only happens to girls. So it's not necessarily because people have this popular idea that you know, men and boys won't admit to rape because they're just too macho. That's that's such an oversimplification. Part of the problem is many men who've been violated and boys who've been violated don't know they've been violated because they've not been given a definition of violation that includes them. So I've counseled boys in seventh, eighth grade who, when I got them to speak about their experiences, had clearly been violated. But mm. they, they hadn't seen a film, a documentary, a popular TV show, hadn't even heard a song on the radio that mm. framed their experience in a way that they could identify with. So, mm. it, it, so those are the kind of conversations I think really need to be teased out and explored. Uh, so I definitely agree with you there. Um, mm -hmm. I want to open up uh, to the chat as far as any direct questions. Uh, I'm sifting back through the comments I may have missed from the last few moments. But if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Golden, this would be a good time to extend them. Um, if you posted it and I missed it, um, you know, repost it, if you will. But I definitely want you guys to take advantage of, of having him here while we do, because uh, I'm not going to hold him too long. I know he's he's had a pretty uh, long day. So I want to definitely, uh, uh, you know, show my appreciation to the brother by not having him, you know, on here for eight hours. But um, if you have any questions for Dr. Golden, please put post them up now. Um, in terms of your, your, now, now you're, you're solely teaching, are you still practicing law on the side? How does that work? For so you? I, I'm, I, uh, my law license is not active right now, but okay. I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping now that I, I had to do a lot of heavy academic lifting the past four year, few years, yeah, four years or so, uh, my life has encountered a tremendous shift and transition. So I live out here on the West Coast now. I'm no longer married. Mm -hmm. So having been through a divorce and having been through grief, uh, you know, and grieving that loss, it's uh, those personal setbacks have uh, resulted in a lot of delays in my academic work and publications. Okay. So I spent most of the past two years or so sort of getting caught up with that. And now that a lot of that heavy lifting is done, um, I intend to continue, of course, to write and publish. I have a full teaching load at my university. So okay. I'm, I'm the director of the legal studies program. We have mm -hmm. a legal studies minor. It's a, we have a pre-law designation. And I'm also the director of uh, something called the Donald Blake Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Culture. Okay. So we put on an academic conference every year. So I have administrative responsibilities. And you know how it is, Dr. Johnson. I have committee responsibilities. I'm on the rank and tenure committee. So, you know, <laughs> so you work between the, between, I'm working, man, between the committee work, my work as director of the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity and Culture, my my teaching and, of course, a full research agenda. Yeah, it's uh, it's often hard to you stick around and uh, stick around home and get writing done. But the good news is I have a sabbatical coming up in the fall. So All right. All right. I'm going to be on leave and I'm going to be settling into more work. I will also probably be reactivating my law license and I'm looking to establish a small federal appellate practice where I can represent indigent criminal defendants on appeal. 
Uh, and that's uh, something I would like to do on the side, one or two cases a year, get the opportunity to write a brief, keep my legal writing skills sharp, stay on top of my courtroom skill, and uh, do something that is significant but manageable in light of all my other responsibilities. So that's my well, that's my short term plan. Well, that's beautiful. And I, I want to say, you know, now that you are newly divorced and based and since you shared with us the circumstances behind that, you know, forgive me, but I got to say congratulations. Uh, <laughs> Thank but, you, man. But I will Thank tell you. you, you know, especially with some of the brothers in this chat, there's been a, a discourse in social media for the last, I'd say, decade or so uh, referred to as red pill. And I can definitely tell you that you, you're 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 not only in company in regard to where you are in your life, but uh you are actually the prize. So um, trust me when I tell you, a brother with a PhD, a law degree, uh, and you're out here doing the work, don't, we're not going to let you. This community that you are hearing, you seeing in this comedy, we're not going to let you walk away from here thinking that you are not the prize, brother. So we're going to go into more detail on that. But um, we had a question. We had a couple of them. Uh, one from Black Outcast Media Broadcasting. He asks, Will you continue to explore the metaphysical analysis in the masculine space? Um, that's one of the questions we got. Uh, the second question was, you know, and this is up to you if you want to answer. So it's a, it looks like a private question, but it, it's does Dr. Golden's ex-wife show some of her abusive side or did she do the bait and switch on him? You know, I, I think that means, you know, did you that were there signs of abusive tendencies before? Uh, you mm -hmm. married. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll start with those two. And there's 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 at least uh, one more question in there. Sure. Sure. There, there were. I'll start with the second one first. There were signs of abusive tendencies before I got married. But uh, another disadvantage and it's not a criticism, but a disadvantage of uh, certain Christian religious communities is that you can through the internalization of certain dogmas convince mm -hmm. yourself that you're making a good godly decision okay. when you're actually not. And there was a lot of that going on when I, before I married my ex-wife. There was mm -hmm. a lot of spiritualizing. There was a lot of theological abstraction, sort of removing myself from the concrete realities of my situation where I observed very strong abusive tendencies, but nevertheless chose to ignore them and overlook them in favor of, and this is a dogma in the church, of loving my wife as Christ has loved the church and gave, given himself for it, right? Okay. Uh, so yes, there were tendencies there. Uh, and I should also, in the interest of transparency, indicate that when I, when I did get married, one of the reasons I overlooked these tendencies was because I got married with a, um, a, a sense of self-esteem that was already damaged yeah. somewhat yeah. Through, uh, through some prior uh, emotionally abusive relationships. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was already compromised. Yeah. And yeah. That, that being compromised in that way led me to overlook things that I should not have overlooked. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my answer to that. Um, the second question, uh, as to the metaphysical nature of masculinity, I believe it was. Will you continue to explore the metaphysical analysis in the masculine space? So I guess yes. if your work is coming into black male studies more, will you still deal with it, the metaphysical aspect of it? Um, I'd probably, my work is probably conceived of as, if, if I'm doing an ontology or a metaphysics of black masculinity, it's going to be social, mm. right? It's going to be a social ontology. That is to say, uh, you know, one of the popular lines of thinking with regard to race, for example, in the academy is that it's not biologically real, but it's still socially real, right? Uh -huh. So mm. any ontological or metaphysical or epistemic work that I do around black masculinity will be geared toward more of a social metaphysics and a social ontology and a social epistemology that accounts for black male embodiment and the ways in which the black male body is always already scripted and marked as hypersexual, criminal, 
et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if I am doing that kind of work, it will be a, it will be metaphysical work. It will be ontological and epistemic, but it will be rooted in sociality and not in classical metaphysics and epistemology and their attendant abstractions. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. I think we had uh, another question in here. <clears throat> um, Ian Graves asks, can he speak on the LGBTQ movement on male mental and physical health and healing? Hmm. Hmm. Male metaphysical, male mental and physical health and healing. healing. Um, and I guess he's relating that to the LGBTQ movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm not, I'm not, could we get that person to clarify that question? All right. uh, Ian, see if you can give us a little clarification on the question. Um, and in the meantime, while he, he gives us some clarification, he posted another, he asked, uh, are you afraid of any pushback against your work? Uh, so Ian, if you could clarify your other question and, and we'll get Dr. Golden on this one first. Yeah, I guess it would be, I, I guess I, uh, I wouldn't say that I'm afraid of pushback on my work. I'm certainly aware that it will be out there. Mm -hmm. But isn't this what we do in the academy? Mm -hmm. Don't aren't we supposed to discuss and debate new ideas? Mm -hmm. And I think along these lines, it's important to say that this is not a black male studies is not a zero sum game. The centering of black male experience does not imply a decentering of black women. It does not, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, it's not a, it's not mm -hmm. a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't the case. It is not the case that black male studies is some sort of uh, epistemically and ontologically violent space in which black men are going to berate and castigate black women and uh, make them somehow the, you know, the scapegoat uh, for all that is wrong with black men. These are the kinds of terribly uninformed and, and sort of ad hominem debates that you find on black Twitter, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have no interest in 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 decentering black women and, and the fact that black men find themselves in a space where their experience has been ignored, that doesn't negate the, the centuries of neglect toward black women either, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I think if if we're gonna start uh, at a, I wouldn't say that I'm afraid that my work will receive pushback, but I am aware of it. Yeah. And I would say that in the interest of that awareness, that anyone who is is somehow reticent uh, or about my work or, or anyone else's work in black male studies would remember that, you know, certainly not for me. And I don't think for anyone else, I don't think for Dr. Curry or you or any of the black men who are doing black male studies, uh, it, it's it is a straw man mm -hmm. to suggest to suggest that black male studies somehow is violent against black women. That that's right. just false, right? right. So, uh, am I afraid? No. Am I aware? Yes. And as mm -hmm. part of that that awareness, it's important to obliterate mm -hmm. the straw man characterization of black male studies as some sort of phallocentric mm. violence toward right. black women, or toward white women, mm -hmm. or toward any woman whatsoever. I think that's just false, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think we need to be aware of that. Well, shout out real quick to Donnell. Thank you for the contribution. Um, I just want to, what I'll add to that is I definitely agree. I, I do, I would add the caveat, however, that in other areas, in other, uh, in other uh, fields, if as it were, um, being critical when necessary uh, in regard to women and girls or whatever it may be is unwelcome. I will say that. And, and I do, I, I do want to see a black male studies that if the situation, if the research, if the, if the issue at hand requires that, that, that that be allowed. If you know, it, it's, oh. it's, it's not about going out of, out of out of one's way to attack black women, but it, it, but if it's part of the discourse and it needs to be said and it cannot be said anywhere else, 
than it should be. And I think that type of intellectual honesty is difficult, you know, especially because there are so few of us, uh, you know, a, a, as faculty. I mean, what are we? We're less than one percent. And since 1976, uh, you know, black men have only gotten half the degrees of black women. So we're not in the academy in any great number. And, and so I think to that extent, there needs to be a space for black men to articulate their experiences, regardless of who may not like it. You know, but I, I, I think we're actually saying very similar things. So I just wanted to kind of add to that. But um, in respect to Dr. Golden's time, uh, I do want to thank him for being on the Onyx Report. I appreciate that, brother. Thank you for coming through. And I apologize again uh, for, okay. for how I handled the fall, but I will not <laughs> let that happen again. Um, no thank problem. you. And, and we we know both of your books are are forthcoming. So, yes. you know, if you want to share with the audience, you know, how they can read some of your work, how they can support what you're doing and where can they find you? So you can find me uh, on uh, Twitter at a truly golden man. You is. can also find me on Instagram at a truly golden man. And you can find me on Facebook uh, under my name, Tim Golden. Um, if you Google my name, Tim Golden and philosophy, I've done some early work on black philosophy and the philosophy of religion, um, where I engaged a lot of James Cone's liberation theology and read him with David Walker, David Walker's appeal and so forth. So you can find me there. And as soon as my books uh, are published, which will be later this year, okay. I'll be happy to uh, I'll be sharing those Amazon links through all of my social media outlets. So um, be on the be on the lookout for those things. They'll co they'll be coming later this year. Well, I want to extend a, a preemptive invite, man. So when when either book, both books, when they come out, you have a standing invitation to come back. I hope you'll talk to us about what you're doing and, and, sure. and the work you published. And I definitely want to push people to go ahead and pick it up, man. So so I, you know, I'm letting you know now you got a standing invite. So oh, let me man. know. Dr. Johnson, that means a lot to me, man. I'm so grateful to you and for the wonderful work that you do and for your efforts with this uh, with this podcast. It is really a space in which a lot of healing can take place. You know, I've, I've learned that there's healing in telling your story. And every time I get to tell it, Absolutely. I heal a little bit more. And as a survivor yourself, I'm sure you understand that. So I wanted to say thank you from, from the bottom of my heart for providing a forum in which I can do this honestly, openly, constructively, and in a way that I'm hoping will help other uh, other uh, black men and women out there mm -hmm. to to understand black men better. So thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to coming back to talk about some more of my work. Well, we do as well. All right, and I'm I wanted to to read this off to you know I'm I'm probably going to start closing my show with this, but I I want to affirm it. Um, so I want to thank people for joining the Honest Report. But I want black men to remember more than anything that we are not criminals by birth. We're not perennial rapists, incapable intellects. We're not man children. We are not sperm banks. We're not child support sources. We're not sub success objects, walking phalluses, ATM machines, lottery tickets, unpaid bodyguards, interchangeable stepfathers, child discipline proxies, unpaid repairmen, workhorses, or any mm. other socially accepted mm. dehumanizing stereotype. We are thinkers, Great, inventors, Great. innovators, leaders, fathers, and men. Embrace your humanity, my brothers. Know your worth and extend your time and attention and resources only to those who genuinely respect you. All right. Peace, y'all.